previous videos, we created our very simple ALU. But as it stands now, the ALU has nothing to interface with and nowhere to store its results except for the ALU hold register. In these videos, we'll be creating the register file that will act as the primary form of temporary storage in our system. Every computer has registers in place to handle data between operations. The purpose of each register can vary wildly depending on the architecture. Some registers are general purpose, and other times they serve a very specific function. And even then, the purpose of the register can change depending on the context of what the computer is doing at that particular time. There are eight registers in total on the TCPU 816. Four of them are special purpose registers, the ALU hold register, the instruction register, and the high and low address buffer registers. Those registers have a fixed function that can't be changed. We'll look at those registers later on, but for now we'll be looking at the remaining four registers. These four registers are the general purpose registers used for computing. However, these registers also have special statuses assigned to each one. The registers are the accumulator, the X register, the Y register, and the system register. The accumulator is both the output and one of the inputs to the ALU. The X and Y registers are true general purpose registers, which are also used for indexing and some of the opcodes. This arrangement follows the 6502 CPU design on a rough level. And finally, the system register is used by the microprograms when the computer is running. And this register is not usable by the programmer. We'll get into what the microprograms are later on during the Control Logic series. But for now, we're going to dive into building these four registers and attaching them to the data bus, along with the ALU. Now, you could have four independent registers and have this work. However, when it comes to building the physical computer, Having four discrete registers along with all the addressing logic would take upwards of 10 physical chips. And that's a lot of board space that would need to be devoted just to these four registers. So instead we'll be using a register file. This takes all the chips needed for the registers and the logic and reduces it down to just two chips. And this is great. It makes things so much easier and cheaper when it comes time to build out the computer. There are some behaviors that we need to be aware of when using the register files. First, it behaves like a very small DDR RAM chip in the sense that it can read and write data at the same time. But this also means that the registers are not edge triggered. And this differs from the register module we created earlier. To maintain parity with the real hardware, we'll start by creating this register file as a new module. In the parts list on the left, make a new module and name it reg underscore file. We'll start by placing a new register from the stock parts. And once it's placed, click on it and change the properties to make it trigger on the low level. Now make three copies of this register. And now we'll set up the decoding logic. First, let's create the input and output pins we need. This includes the two bit read write address lines, the data bus input and output, and the read and write enable pins. Now let's join all the data inputs of the registers to the data bus. and then connect all the register enables to the write enable pin. As for the write enable pins on the registers themselves, that's where we'll need to use our address lines to select which one we want. And to do that, we'll use a two to four decoder. Positioning it face down and then wiring the outputs from the decoder to each of the respective write enable pins. Then we'll use a splitter to connect the decoder to the input address lines. And we're going to do this whole thing again for the output address lines, but the registers themselves don't have an output enable pin. So we'll have to add that in ourselves. To do that, we're going to use a controlled buffer and an AND gate for each register output. One side of the AND gate is then wired into the decoder and the other side of the AND gate will need to connect to the inverted read enable line. I'm also going to add direct outputs for each register. This isn't a part of the real hardware, but this is gonna help us later on when it comes to debugging this computer. Now, if you wanted to, you could replace a lot of this output circuitry with a multiplexer. The reason I didn't do this though is that an off-the-shelf parallel 8-bit 4 to 1 multiplexer doesn't exist in real life. And I think laying out like this gives a better impression of what's going on. But if you want to make things slightly more efficient, I'll leave that up to you. Before we begin testing, make sure that your decoders have the include enable option set to no. 
and that the outputs from both decoders match up with each register. So for example, both output zero lines from the decoders should point to the same register. Now we can start unit testing our circuit. First set the read and write enable lines high. Now we'll go through and place the values one through four into each register by using the write address lines and by toggling the write enable line. Afterwards, you should see the values stored in the registers. Now using the read address lines and read enable, we should be able to output the data correctly on the data bus. And while read enable is active, we should be able to also write a value to a different register. If all of this behaves as expected, our module now matches the behavior of the 74HC670, at least on a logical level. Back at the main project page, we can add a register file to the project. And with that, I think this is a good place to end this video. While it might not seem like we did very much, by creating this part, we will create dividends when we progress into this computer build. So with that, I'll see you in the next part.